Um, so welcome everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Gracias a todos por venir. Um, and thank you to the ASU LACMA uh, fellowship program and to Angelica for inviting us. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like um, so happy to be able to talk about this work. Um, so I'm, as you heard, I'm Natalia Espinosa. I'm an Associate Registrar for Rights and Reproductions at the Getty Museum in LA. Um, there we go. Um, you see, um, I'm very excited to share with you this document that Adrián, um, Diana, Margarita, and Susana Reyes, who's going to come today. Um, we, both, we all offer this document, Strategies for Engaging and Representing the Information Museum. And you can download it. I don't know if somebody can. Um, post a link. Um, you can download it um, from AEM's website in both English and Spanish. Um, if you just put it on the chat, that would be great. Um, so we created this document um, from sort of based on, on a growing interest from different uh, museum professionals that we meet at AEM's annual meetings and, and other venues, and they would ask us how they could better attract and serve Latino audiences. So we have been talking about this for a while, you know, we would reply to their questions, but really there was no um, tool that we could sort of point them to, um, to, to help them. So we decided to create this. Um, it is, it took us, <laughs> it took us about, we say two years, but it, it's really more than that. We were discussing um, the creation of this document for many years. And the actual writing of it um, took two years. So um, we, oh, there we go. Um, it includes nine thematic chapters. Um, and you'll see, um, there we go. Um, you'll see them here. Each one has uh, background information and some guiding questions and writing strategies that will help you direct um, your work to better engage Latinos at your institution. We try to keep in mind um, sort of a flexibility of how these, these guiding strategies or tools could be used by different museums or cultural institutions. Um, and we hope that you can take them and adapt them to your own particular setting. So the content was developed by, by us, the authors we just met, um, in conjunction with some other Latino network members. And we sort of developed the, the main topic areas that way. And then we conducted a survey, um, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews, and we shared our findings at, with a national group of reviewers who would give us feedback and we would sort of process it that way. So today we're, we want to discuss these different sections with you, um, sort of little summaries, if you will. Um, and, and we hope that they can inspire you to either start or, or continue your work to better engage um, and represent Latinos in museums. Um, I know that several of you uh, work in museums or are interested in working in museums. And uh, we hope that you share your work, you publish your work, you evaluate your work so that you can contribute to this, to this document. We want this to be a living document and we want it to keep growing. So please, please, please share uh, your work so we can keep evolving this. Um, and now I leave you with Diana, who will tackle the very difficult question, which is the, the first chapter of this document. Hola, buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos. I hope you hear me um, okay. Delia Sofia, if you don't, do, to let me know. Um, so yes, uh, we decided to open the strategies with a topic that is indeed very complex and it pertains to how Latinos self-identify and how the media, the government and businesses choose to identify our communities. So the question who is Latino is a challenging one to answer, even for someone like me who self-identifies as Latina. 
in this resource, our goal was not to define who is Latino, but rather to introduce readers to the variety of terms associated with individuals and communities who share cultural and historical ties to Latin America, Spain, and potentially other countries. In doing so, our goal is to address the multiple dimensions of diversity found within Latino communities. And, and the key takeaway, the golden nugget, is that Latinos are not a monolithic group. So we unpack very briefly terms such as Latino, Hispanic, and Latinx, and we discuss their connotations. Now, these broad categories are not universally liked, used, or embraced by the very communities that they aim to represent. Their adoption and rejection depends on the context in which they are used, on the history of specific communities, and of course, on individual preferences. In the document, we chose to use the term Latino because we believe that it is the one that currently has the most widespread use and acceptance within the community, but that is actually debatable, uh, depending on, on where, you, where you are and how you feel about these um, terms. We also discuss other ways in which we self-identify with terms tied to our countries of origin, to our experiences in the United States, or to our political empowerment, among others. Some examples include uh, terms such as Colombian American, Cuban American, Chicana, Puerto Rican, Boricua, and New Rican, just to name a few. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born abroad and self-identify as both Latina and Mexican American. Um, my American father immigrated to Mexico and married my mom, who is from an indigenous community um, in Oaxaca, Mexico. Saying that I'm Mexican American is a nod to my mixed background. My nephew, on the other hand, was born in New Jersey, and he described himself the other day as American Mexicano. I thought that was an interesting choice, one that reflects how he sees his affiliation to the US and to Mexico, and also how he embraces two languages, English and Spanish. What I'm getting at is that self-identification is a very personal choice, and identity terms don't always mean what you think they do. In fact, identity labels can sometimes mask the true diversity of an individual or a community. We underscore that Latinos can be American Indian, African, Asian, European, or any combination of these socially defined races. The terms Hispanic, Latino, Latinx pertain to an ethnicity, not to our geographic ancestry. Excuse me. While often described as brown, Latinos are also black, white, and every shade in between. With regard to our connections to the United States, some of us were here before the US was even a country. Um, some of us are from Puerto Rico, a US unincorporated territory. And some of us are more recent immigrants, having come to the US to seek freedom or better opportunities for ourselves and our families. Regarding language, we ask readers not to assume that all Latinos speak Spanish. Some of us may only speak English, some of us may speak an indigenous language, and some of us may speak other languages. In my home, we speak English, Spanish, Spanglish, and also my mother's indigenous language, Mazatec. So after reading this introductory section, we hope that readers will one, check and update their assumptions about who is Latino, two, know the importance of understanding how Latino communities perceive themselves and choose to self-identify, and three, begin to realize the need for targeted engagement strategies that factor in the histories, characteristics, and needs of their Latino audiences. So now it's um, over back to Natalie to discuss the next, next section. So um, we wanted to tackle also in this document sort of ideas, basic ideas about the core of many of the of history, this, this canon of what makes the history, the established history. And for many, many years, um, and in many meetings and sessions and panels like this one, we have discussed uh, how museums are not neutral. Um, we have the great of wonderful organizations who, who have made t shirts and stickers and everything. Um, but still, uh, this 
the point hasn't changed. We know that the architecture displays collections and narratives of museums reflect the values, worldviews, and aesthetic preferences of their founders and of their past and present leaders, who are in large part white men. Um, but unfortunately, not much uh, has changed in museums despite our increasing awareness of this problem and despite the world changing around them. Even though uh, Latinos are the second largest ethnic group in the United States, representing 18% of the country's population, and it is projected that by 2060, it will be 28% or almost one third of the US population. And despite the fact that Latinos are young, increasingly educated, employed, connected, entrepreneurial, and upwardly mobile, and of course, Latino culture, uh, food, music, sports, film, um, all those things are becoming important an important part of mainstream America. Um, for one, I would say that in my museum, we have faculty days every Tuesday and Wednesday. So, so there you have. Um, so we're still not appropriately represented in museum staff or collections. And often we're not even considered to be an audience that should be addressed by US museums. Um, but this lack of representation in museums not only ignores the present, but it also dismisses the centuries long presence in the United States. As Diana mentioned, some of us have been here for longer than this country has been a country. Um, and many, uh, the many and continuing contributions Latinos have made to this country's history and culture. Um, and if you look at it purely from, from a business standpoint, this lack of representation reduces the movement's ability to be relevant and interesting to a growing sector of the population. So it doesn't make business sense either. We wanted to tackle um, these points and ask and have, have uh, people who read this document ask themselves, um, what will happen if museums or when museums become truly more inclusive spaces? Um, we wanted to sort of have a little bit of a call to action. Um, and our, our answer is that they will attract new visitors who have previously felt disconnected or intimidated. They will validate the cultural importance of different groups, including Latinas, and they will invite different ways of seeing and understanding the world. One of the, the or in, in the document, we looked at several organizations um, who have done this work. Um, and one of the, the ones that, that struck us was the Smithsonian Institution, who, um, after there was a um, we published a, a report in 1994 titled Willful Neglect, the Smithsonian Institution and U.S. Latinos found that, quote, the Smithsonian Institution, the largest museum complex in the world, displays a pattern of willful neglect towards the estimated 25 million Latinos in the United States. Um, and after that report came out, they established the Smithsonian Latino Center, um, which, has, which has been spearing efforts to to be more inclusive of Latinos throughout the museum. And more recently, um, I think it was in December 2020, and other people can correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong, um, they passed, Congress passed a law to authorize the Smithsonian Museum of the American Latino, um, which is in the works. And the other I can give us a little speech after the presentation. Um, so we, we point to these organizations as, a, as an example of how museums can, can do this work. So as you leave today, um, we want you to ask yourselves, how can my museum represent Latinos in ways that are more historically accurate, uh, in ways that celebrate their diverse cultural heritage? And how can my museum do a better job highlighting the achievements of Latinos? So we just want you to think about those things and to mold them. Over. As you may have caught on now, we like go back and forth. And what we're trying to do is kind of show you uh, some of the areas and the sections that we worked in the um, guiding and some guiding strategies. Um, some may be in, in question form. That uh, is what we kind of chose. And some are, are a little bit more like uh, recommendations or things to think about. Um, so the section that I'm going to be talking about next is knowing your community. And that is I mean, that's like that to a lot of us uh, and a lot of you, uh, this is some some work that you already do is work that you do on a daily basis is something that you 
uh, if you're new to the profession, that is something that you're looking to learn more about. Uh, so there's no right way to go about this, but there is, there is a start point and there's some things to keep in mind. Um, so we try to have this section um, be a little bit more practical, um, just so people who are looking for uh, where to start, right? Um, something that is important and we all know is that knowing who, who the Latino community in your area is, is incredibly important. Knowing their history, their demographics, uh, what cultural backgrounds uh, do they have, um, and how all of that would be would enter in play when you're trying to serve them in a better way through museum work or uh, you know a science museum or a botanic garden whatever the work you're doing how that connects so that's why it's so important um, you might have a very um, large community Latino community you might have a very small one an established one um, like Dana was saying you know the you know Mexican community was here before the American community or you may have a very young community, like it's my case in Memphis. You know, we have a younger Latino community. So all of those things uh, kind of fall into place when you're trying to serve um, the different uh, communities. So where to start, how, what to do this. Um, basically, look around you. Start with who and um, start the, with the basics, you know, like your neighborhood, your city. Uh, look at county, city level. Uh, look in the census very cautiously because that usually doesn't really reflect, but it's a start. Uh, I would say um, a really great uh, strategy or, or place to start is schools. Schools keep track of the, the data they needed for funding. So that's a, a good place to start. Um, I think also, and I, I, I did this 14 years ago in, in this area, walk in your neighborhood, go outside and go take a walk, go ride in the car and try to identify businesses, organizations, schools, uh, things that are surrounding you immediately first. Uh, I think that's a really great um, first step. This may have been done already. Grab what you already have and maybe delve a little bit deeper um, if that's the case. Uh, you know, you, if you're looking at a city like Chicago, well, you know, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of work already done there and there's, but you may want to look at a little bit more of a, the pocket that surrounds your, your specific area. Um, identify the local history. The local Latino history could be, again, very broad or very, very specific to a neighborhood. In Memphis, the Latino community is like a chessboard. There's a, a neighborhood here. There's another one here. There's just a block here. So it could be that it's all centralized or people are everywhere. And so that affects the way you reach people. Um, Latino media popping up everywhere. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, digital uh, media um, resources now everywhere. So you, you may not have a, an official radio station or a newspaper, but there are a lot of digital opportunities out there. And, and that's how people are communicating these days um, also with their countries of origin. Universities have a lot of information. A lot of the universities are doing work with poverty reports. Uh, they're doing a lot of uh, demographic data that reports back, that, that uh, goes back to the city, that the city is working with them. Try to get into that information, I think is very important. And of course, there are other nonprofits, not necessarily museums that are already um, getting this information. So you may just wanna kind of partner up, buddy up with a couple of other organizations and find some funding to figure this out. Um, Latino leaders, wherever you are, there's a Latino leader, whatever. And I can't tell you what it looks like. It may be a, a chair of an art department. It may be the, the store owner uh, that everybody goes to for resources. It may be your neighbor. It may be someone already in your museum that is already part of your museum that you may not have recognized. It could be a vendor. It could be somebody that you uh, have been in business for years. And, you know, that may be a really good resource. Um, I have talked to other museum directors in this city and they asked me, how, how do I know if people are coming? I said, well, just go down to your lobby and just see who walks through the door. You, you may have some answers um, right there. In case of, you know, large cities with larger Latino communities, 
um, it might be a little bit easier because there might be more uh, pronounced, there might be more visibility um, in the media or uh, within the city um, grants. So all that information that sometimes is put out when people get grants, you may find some, some of these folks there. Um, you know, anytime you reach out to a leader, uh, make sure that the way you reach out is, is right. Um, get to know people, invite them over to, to see what you're up to, but also get very involved in what they're doing. Um, it is important, I think, to try to identify which, you know, what the demographic of your own museum is as far as museum professionals and Latino museum professionals, who is working in your museum that is already doing the work that is identified as Latino. And I know Adriana is gonna uh, talk to you a little bit about that in a second, um, but always trying to identify, you kind of become this like a, a, like a anthropologist on the lookout for just that specific uh, kind of audience in, in many ways um, and understanding it. I would suggest when you do this work, do not do it alone. You know, find other people in your institution that do this work with you. So if in case you, move to another institution, there's still people in the same organization that continue the work, right? That's very important, specifically when we are like the only Latino in the museum or the, oh, she knows everybody, we, you know, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, I think after you kind of get that started, I think the next step, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a second, is how do we collaborate? You know, how do we get in? How do we how do we make sure we con we connect, right? So that's what we want to do. Is like the next best thing is how do we connect? Um, so I think uh, at this point I will just pass it on to Adrian, who's going to tell you um, some really important uh, guiding strategies on uh, identifying, um, you know, and how to how to work with Latino professionals. Just again, thank you so much for having us, uh, uh, Dr. Afanador, and I want to give a, a shout out to uh, our uh, national uh, uh, partners and collaborators that are on the line, uh, including uh, Director Mickey Garcia uh, at the ASU Art Museum, as well as Gabriela Martinez at LACMA. Um, thank you for uh, supporting this work and obviously supporting the work we do together. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, um, I'm going to uh, take a moment and. Uh, focus back on our presentation. It's just so amazing to see such a group of uh, really talented and amazing museum professionals all together here or those that want to do this work. So um, I'm going to stop gushing and talk to you about uh, organizational assessment. Uh, and so really this section in the strategies document serves as an informal self-assessment for your organization on Latino engagement and representation. And so this is a self-check not only at a programmatic level, the strategies document really looks at all functional areas and all levels of the museum. So what we have here is an opportunity for honest self-reflection and introspection to, ide to identify your museum's baseline and uh, subsequent strategic goals. Um, so, you know, a lot of times this document is written at a level for as an entry point for all museum professionals. And so I think that maybe some of the things you're hearing here today are like, oh, well, I know how to do this, or yes, we do this. But I just want to kind of recenter ourselves that this is for the folks that either want to get started or, you know, need backup to prove, you know, of, of what they're doing, uh, so to speak. Um, so thinking about, you know, Latino engagement, a big question on how to integrate this is, you know, how to integrate this into your museum's approaches. And so I think Margarita said something very interesting is like, is this work being done by one department? Is this work being done by one person? Like, are you the one carrying this work for your entire institution? And so uh, there's an article written by uh, Jill Stein, Cecilia Garibay, and Catherine Wilson uh, called Engaging Immigrant Audiences in Museums. And so one of the things they tell us is that a, collaborat a collaborative effort that enlists all departments um, uh, without that collaborative effort, effective engagement with the Latino community will be hard to achieve and sustain. And so thinking of longevity, thinking of that sustained and multiple touch points, um, it's important for at all levels and departments, 
for everyone to be equally committed to serving Latino communities in, an, in a way that's authentic, that's respectful, that's open-minded. Um, there's also a, a document produced by the American Alliance of Museums called Facing Change um, that also offers insights on carrying out this important DEAI work. Um, and so um, as uh, readers think about undertaking these steps, you know, um, you may be thinking, or there may be thoughts of, well, who in the team is the best to lead this effort? And so one of the things we always try to tell folks is that um, not every museum professional that happens to be of Latino or Hispanic heritage may necessarily be an expert in DEAI work. And so it's also important to acknowledge if they're, if they're a good fit and if they are, that they're being properly supported. So it's not just, you're gonna be in charge of this and thank you very much. Uh, and so, you know, as, as, as the teams and, and as folks start looking through these questions, we really encourage, you know, honesty and reflection. And so some key takeaways are kind of like the who, what, where, and how in terms of like, what initiatives have you done in the past? Who led them? Are they still here? Uh, were they successful? Or how do you even define success? Or what are lessons learned? Did you document that? Um, and back to Margarita's earlier point of what segments of the community do you want to reach? And how does this tie into your mission? And so, you know, uh, back to that previous point where, you know, the Latino community is not a monolith, which I think is like one of the big takeaways of just this document in general, but reaching out to families, reaching out to teens, reaching out to young professionals, each require a different approach. And so just even thinking of how you tailor your outreach. Um, also, you know, is your leadership involved? Does your board know? Do they support this work? And so, you know, and one of the things is that how do you get, you know, your executive directors to embed this into the overall being of the work of the organization? Is it, is there an existing engagement plan? Is this part of your strategic plan? You know, how does this become a cornerstone or a pillar of your work? Um, and then obviously talking about money and financial resources, like, is there something that your development team can fundraise or apply for grants to meaningfully support this work? Um, and really also anchoring uh, and thinking about first voice in your staff. Um, and uh, Diana will talk about this a little bit later, but just thinking about, do you have uh, like Latino staff in leadership and curatorial or in any, in all levels uh, to help influence either strategic priorities, hiring practices to help raise money, um, you know, or in general, do you have staff that are committed to doing this work, to doing Latino audience engagement and representation? And so I think that, you know, that's kind of like the, the points of review, reflection and assessment. Um, and so for a lot of folks we're like, well, if you don't meet all the boxes, the fact that you're reading this means you're taking the first step. So, you know, that's kind of where we want to, um, you know, encourage that, uh, that, that way forward. Um, and so I'm gonna shift gears uh, and quickly talk about culturally specific content, um, which is our next slide. And this is a next chapter in the strategies document um, that centers around culturally specific content, whether it's in collections, exhibits, programs, and other areas. Um, and so a big question a lot of times is what content is attractive for Latino audiences? And so, you know, um, we always tell folks that it's obviously not a one size fits all answers. And so we can't always assume and we shouldn't assume that Latinos are only interested in Latino content. Um, and so we also can't assume that a strategy or approach that works for a community in Los Angeles will work for a community in Miami or in Boston, for example. And so but how do you offer experiences and how do you maintain connections with Latino communities um, given, you know, back to this notion that, you know, the community as a whole is not a monolith. And one of the things that we suggest is encourage is encouraging co-creation with your communities. And so working together, museums can develop content that meets the goals of the organization that also resonates with Latino audiences. And so I think it's important to remove any real or perceived access barriers to your organization to allow meaningful and authentic programs and experiences. So from the get-go, like from the ground up building together. And in addition to that, you know, another key takeaway from this section is back to that notion of first voice representation in museums. And so this idea, this is the idea of self-representation in a culturally specific context that's fostered not only through engaging community members for input, but again, 
hiring culturally competent staff, or if you don't have that expertise, bringing in consultants to help shape and do this work. Um, and so the strategies in this section invite us to think of how we intentionally and authentically engage with Latino communities. And it continues that thread of self-assessment and reflection from the last section, including uh, in, in four key areas, which are staff, collections, exhibitions, and programs. And so it asks questions of, you know, do you have staff on board that are knowledgeable in creating uh, culturally specific content? Or what stories can you tell with your collections? You know, do you have collections that tell the stories of these communities? Or how do you even catalog them? Um, does that help you build exhibitions that tell Latino stories? Can they be bilingual? Or how do you highlight Latino content or speakers um, in programs that may necessarily, may or may not necessarily have to be Latino specific? Um, and so as, as organizations develop their short and their long-term plans, you know, it's important to listen to your target audiences. And I think that's a thread we talk about throughout, um, as well as your staff that are working on this. Like, you know, we, at least for, you know, the, the big folks, the, the leaders on top, you know, your staff are the experts, you know, that know, you know, what in terms of, of, of meaningful engagement um, for the most part. And so the goal is to go beyond Hispanic Heritage Month as the only time that you engage or you present Latino content or target Latino audiences. And so a true commitment to this work, uh, you know, it celebrates Hispanic heritage, you know, 365 days a year, you know, and really integrates that into your museum strategy and approach. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Margarita to talk about community collaborations and outreach to keep this going. Um, thank you, Adrian. Um, so community collaboration, I guess, and outreach um, at this point, you know, if you've kind of already kind of done some of the work and your museum's already kind of embedded a little bit in, in the notions of wanting actively to reach out to uh, Latino audiences, um, it's, it's very important. This is like a really important step. Uh, you have to be very cautious. Uh, from experience, I can tell you that sometimes you get very excited and you get all these things in the works and all these projects and programs. And at the end of the day, um, to, to either your superiors or to the funding, it just was really a box to check. Right, so we have to be very, very cautious on how we commit to a collaboration of a program or a project or an event that has huge potential to become a sustainable partnership if you are like the one or with a few other people working on it. This has to be an institutional commitment. Um, it has happened to me many times. It happened last week. I mean, you have these really great programs and ideas and connections with the community. They come to you. They want to do the work with you. Um, but not everybody is on the same page. So that back to what Adrian was saying of strategizing and having a very clear idea of how you're doing this and who is helping you do this is very, very important. Your institution has to be ready for this. Um, I think that that's very important. Now, talking specifically about collaborations, um, there's a couple of images that I include in, the, in, this, um, in this slide. The one more recent is a quinceanera exhibit that I have up right now in my gallery, my interactive gallery, which is managed by the education department. Um, that is a clear example of a, you know, a, a collaboration that turned into a partnership. Um, the exhibition was created, co-created by eight young ladies and their mothers. They put it all together. I was the facilitator. Um, it is interesting how it is viewed among all the other exhibitions that are taking place right now at the Dixon, which is a, um, how do I put this, a more traditional museum with uh, French and American Impressionism. <laughs> so you can so give you an idea. Um, it has been a wonderful um, example of co-creation and collaboration with future partnerships. We have partnered with vendors, artists, all kinds of people to support this, uh, this specific exhibition. Um, and the way it happened is was exactly that. I had to go into the community. I had to meet with folks. I had to volunteer uh, in other organizations. So actively knowing what other organizations and Latino organizations are doing in your community and being part of them is very important. 
Um, if you have the time, join their boards, join their volunteer groups, share volunteers. I would think share resources. You need a, a meeting space, come on over. You need, you know, sharing things uh, is very important. So from the get-go, this collaboration that could turn into a partnership is, no, is not just this box, right? It's like people come to me all the time and they say, hey, Margarita, I want Latino audiences. I, I don't know what happened. I just invited this Latino musician, but nobody came right to my event it's like okay well that's a great step but you know let's take it a little bit further let's dig, dig a little deeper and make sure that is something that the whole institution um support uh the example of this exhibition that i put together has many layers and i'll be happy to talk to any one of you of what the challenges have been continue to be on a daily basis and what uh, have been the surprises because there have been many um i think sustainability is incredibly important. I would suggest you create committees um, if you can. And it, committee sounds like a really uh, strong, almost kind of boring word and official word. So create these groups of people that you know in the community that you do things with um, that can help you identify. They will tell you exactly what it is that they wanna see. Don't assume <laughs> that what you wanna put together is a good idea. That, that's the main key of it, the collaboration. Do not assume that what you're thinking is it. Ask, you have to listen to what people wanna do. And when you're ready to do that, to listen, they're gonna wanna see the results and they're gonna wanna see the results continuously. So that's when you have to be ready to back this work. Um, I think in the guiding strategies for this section, um, you'll see a little bit about co-creation. Uh, and how to partner. I think school systems, again, is huge resources wherever you are, it's really huge. So I will always kind of repeat it. Um, and then also very important, consider who is representing you and how they are approaching people. I think it's very important. Um, again, I'm happy to talk about any of this after this, this meeting is over um, and, and thank you. I, I really hope this helps you in a tidy way. So um, Adrian already mentioned access barriers uh, a little bit earlier. And this is a short section in, in our document, but I, it's a really important one because it could be sort of a downfall of all your other efforts. Um, for example, uh, location. Um, is your museum not reachable by public transportation? Is it in an area that is Sort of intimidating, for example, at the at the Getty where I work is really difficult to reach by public transportation and it's in a very wealthy part of town that can be very intimidating. Um, language. Um, are you not only creating content in different languages, but are you communicating that? Are you is your communications department also um, working in a different language? Are they thinking of Latino media? Are they putting banners and other sorts of things in different parts of town. Um, I know we have been tackling with that, that question um, at, at work too, and, and it's a difficult one. Um, cost can be a barrier. Um, I, we shouldn't assume that the cost is the only barrier, but it could be one of many other barriers. Or we call it a constellation of barriers in the museum. Um, and also, is your museum um able to to receive families or their sitting spaces other places for families to meet for children to sit you know are, can people visit in large groups with different abilities so all these things can be um stopping people from coming to your museum and it, and it is important that you that you think about the, what those could be um not only because latinos might not be coming but these barriers often are barriers for many different communities. So it, it is important that you take a second and, and check um, what these barriers um, could be or could be perceived could be perceived barriers. For example, where I work is it's a free museum, but there's a parking charge and people don't know these different things. So so just getting the information out could also be a barrier as it is for us. Um, so I will pass it on to Paul Adrian. Yes. Uh, so I'm going to uh, 
uh, zip, uh, work through these sections quickly so we have plenty of time for uh, Q&A. So this last section is on language and in, as an engagement tool. I think uh, one of the things that we keep talking about, you know, and just as all of these different pieces, you know, are connectors. They're, you know, uh, language itself is also a cultural connector. Uh, museums are connectors of culture. And so, uh, you know, having bilingual efforts shows the commitment of museums in making its content accessible to larger audiences. And so we also we also uh, posit that it helps foster welcoming spaces where Latinos um, and other communities can see themselves reflected in what the museum has to offer. Um, and so on this slide, you know, um, in, in this section in general, it offers some questions and recommendations in terms of how to effectively use language to engage with Latino audiences, you know, in terms of, you know, do you need to present the content in other languages? Back to getting to know your communities. Um, uh, the fact that bilingual content contributes to more accessible and welcoming spaces. Um, one of the things is going beyond Google Translate, uh, you know, and just thinking about, uh, you know, either working with a native speaker translator or a professional translator or interpreter to make sure that your content is in a literal translation and to incorporate processes within uh, your exhibit design team to account for bilingual text in your galleries. And so, um, uh, full disclosure, I am an educator, and so I feel like a lot of the content, a lot of the conversations on bilingual uh, work in museums centers around exhibits, uh, and so I really want us to think beyond the galleries uh, and think about the materials we produce for museum goers, as well as how we engage as facilitators. Um, so if you could go to the next slide real quick. Um, so uh, this is a publication that uh, we published uh, in uh, September of 20. 20, so right in the middle of COVID. Well, well, uh, and so um, this is an example of how this this book, while it was professionally translated, you know, working with the author, you know, I was going over various rounds of edits, trying to ensure that the Spanish was accessible, not only for younger readers, but also for US Latino communities as a whole. And so an example from this, we, we highlight Cesar Chavez and we highlight Dolores Huerta, um, leaders in the farm workers movement. And in Spanish, we typically use the word campesino to talk about farm workers. But when I got the first rounds of translations, I got trabajador agricola. And so technically both are correct. The, the, not, none of them is wrong, but um, you know, but which one carries more meaning or which is more recognizable? And I think even in the titles of the text that you see here, you know, we were grappling with the word shaping in that, you know, shaping in Spanish is formar. But here we talk about shaping is really making an impact. And so we went with the word forjar, which technically means to forge, you know, but we feel like that had that weight that we were looking for. So, you know, it's like going beyond like uh, and making sure that you're being intentional in what you're producing, that you're reviewing what you're producing. And one final thing I want to share is the next slide is um, about facilitation. And so these are uh, uh, two examples of uh, uh, our Discovery Family Program series that I, that I manage where we bring Smithsonian content out to communities across the US. And we have two activities. The one on the left is about animal classification. And the one on the right is learning about uh, the organic chemistry behind uh, spices in Latino foods. Uh, and that one is my favorite. We did it in Los Angeles. Um, and so how do you talk about organic chemistry or why cilantro tastes the way it does in Spanish? Uh, and so that's where, you know, it's important not only to engage the young kids, which likely are bilingual, but also to engage the whole family unit, la abuela, la tia, everyone who is with the visitor, you know, so that everyone gets learned and that nobody's excluded. And so I think part of language as an engagement tool is also making sure that your facilitators or your people that are are serving bilingual audiences have the tools and the words, you know, that are prepared to go beyond because, you know, you don't want to talk about organic chemistry on the fly uh, on the floor. <laughs> so um, that's my section. Um, I'll pass it over to Diana to uh, talk to us about representation and staff and boards. Yes. So we know that museums have a long way to go. Um, and I think the cultural sector in general um, and the scientific world 
um, they have a long way to go in terms of diversifying um, their staff, the boards, audiences. And this is a gap that we see at professional meetings. Um, you know, it is well known within our professional community. And in this last section, we discuss the need for more diversity across all the functional areas of the museum. And of course, in leadership positions. So we know that when people with diverse experiences and perspectives are in power, you can have a shift in what is possible and what is prioritized and also in what is funded. Uh, last year at the annual meeting of the American Association of Museums, we had Sandra Cisneros as a keynote speaker and um, the person interviewing her asked her, can museums change? And in her very candid style, she responded, well, it depends on who is running the museum. And, you know, even in places with very large Latino populations, Latinas are still not well represented on museum staff um, and boards. And just to give you an example, in Los Angeles County, Latinos represent close to 50% of the population. But um, according to a study done in 2015, only 9% of the arts and cultural workforce identified as Hispanic and Latino. So why are we not present? It's the million dollar question. Um, I know, and I think all of you know, that there are Latino museum professionals out there. There are Latino museum studies students, artists, professionals working in cultural and STEM um, fields. So something has to change. And in order for organizations to become culturally inclusive, um, they really need to have a commitment to ensuring that the staff, the stewards, the advisors represent diverse experiences and, and voices. So the section invites museums to reimagine their organizations, to rethink who they engage to lead and represent them. And really the, the lack of diversity in our field really calls for new hiring practices and priorities, intentional approaches to recruit and retain talent at all levels, and clearly a new mindset, one that, that truly values di diversity. So I'll turn it over to Adrián for uh, final remarks. Um, Diana, thank you so much uh, and to, Everyone, um, Dr. Fanador, uh, the team at the ASU LACMA Master's Fellowship in Art History, the fellows that are here today, uh, Dede Sofia for your moderation. Thank you all for inviting us to be here and share this work with you all today. Um, we really hope that this resource will be useful um, and that it continues to inspire you to continue uh, your work to better serve uh, Latinos at your institutions. Um, I know everyone in this amazing program is has a steadfast commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, uh, and making the institutions we work at more inclusive and welcoming to all communities. So thank you for your work. Um, and again, uh, you know, this document while it's relatively new, you know, it's a living document, I think, to what Natalie was talking about at the beginning, you know, it amalgamates, it builds over 30 plus years of museum work, you know, that our veteran uh, Latino museum workers have been doing since the late 80s and the 90s. Um, and, you know, um, in, in, in claiming and in claiming space for our communities in these institutions. And so we, this project and our Latino museum ecosystem overall, uh, stand on their shoulders in their work. So I just want to acknowledge that this isn't anything that's just happening in these past few years, but it is decades in the making. Um, I also want everyone to know that there is a community and a space for Latina, Latino, Latine, Latinx museum professionals here at the Latino Network of AAM. We'd love to get to know you uh, and find ways to work together and really keep this important work and keep this momentum going.